Welcome to IOHR TV, putting human rights into focus. My name is Trish Lynch. Every time you open a newspaper, there's another piece about Brexit. But there's one story that we believe is more important than all others. Did you know that your basic human rights may be at risk after Brexit? IOHR will be investigating the threat to your rights as we approach March the 29th, 2019, when the UK exits the European Union. With us today is Piers Gardner, a renowned barrister from Moncton Studios right here in London. Mr Gardner has also worked as a solicitor for the European Commission of Human Rights. Piers, good to have you with us on the show today. Thank you for being with us and telling us why we need to pay attention to what could potentially happen to our fundamental rights after March the 29th. Now, what can you tell us in the short term what we need to be looking out for on a personal level come the 29th of March? Well, the first thing to say that is unfortunate, and I wish I didn't have to say it, but lawyers love it. I can tell you what the law is today, but I can't tell you what it'll be on the 29th of March, and the various political changes that'll happen between now and then may or may not address fundamental rights protection. At the moment, it's right at the bottom of the agenda. Nobody's talking about it, and that's what's so very dangerous. The EU's Charter for Fundamental Rights brings together the essential human rights for everybody living in Europe. So why then did some MPs vote against including it in UK law after Brexit? It's absolutely clear that the EU Charter is a consolidating document. It does bring together, as you say, all the rights which are part of international human rights protection, mainly through the European Convention on Human Rights, and also the rights which derive from European Union law. So it's an important document, but it didn't break new ground. It brought together in one place those rights which could be found in different places. And that's a very useful legal thing to do. We are historically extraordinarily bad at that in this country. Our legislation has a little bit here, a little bit there, and a little bit elsewhere. And of course, as everybody knows, we don't have a written constitution as such as one document. So again, there isn't one document to go to. So that's why the EU Charter is an important document. The Charter only applied to EU law activities. What do I mean by EU law activities? Things that the European Union itself did and things that member states did in implementing European Union law. And that's a specific provision. It was hidden at the back of the Charter in Article 51. You had to read to the end to find it out. But there it says that it only applies in national jurisdictions when the national authorities are implementing European law. Now the reason why the government says that the EU Charter should no longer be part of English law is therefore technically very simple. We are no longer going to be implementing EU law after the 29th of March next year. And so we don't need the Charter. Well technically that's right. But it's not as if the Charter was doing any harm in protecting people's fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. It's a very technical reason to throw away a rather good declaration of fundamental rights which gathered together in one place a convenient list of the rights which are reflected in many other places. Now, lots of human rights and equality laws that safeguard disabled people, children, migrants and the LGBT community come from the EU. Could our exit mean that these groups could actually have a lower level of protection? At that moment, at one minute past 11 on the 29th of March next year, nothing changes in terms of the law. If you were protected before, you're protected still. If you weren't protected before, you still aren't. What really changes, though, is who makes the rules. Up until now, the protections you mention, especially in the area of discrimination and uh, disability and workers' rights, those have been key areas where EU law has developed what came before in this country and has been developed tremendously 
over the 40 years while we have been members of the EU, those rights have been buttressed by the fact that they were protected throughout the whole of the European Union, and they still will be. It's just that we aren't going to be part of the European Union anymore. So the question as to whether or not those rights continue, or whether they are pared down, or frankly set aside, is going to be a matter for the government and parliament to decide. And that's the big change. We're losing the collegiate protection and the common standard which exists in all the other European Union countries. EU primary and secondary laws also regulate workers' rights. Does leaving the EU affect their rights, especially in relation to equal pay, holiday entitlement, health and, health and safety protection? All those areas, as you say, have been massively influenced by developments of European Union law. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say that also in those areas of workers' rights, we will see again a transition. And it's a transition back at the very moment of leaving, nothing changes. And we will hear that, I'm sure, from the politicians again and again. We can be sure, we can be confident, nothing changes on the day we leave. But one thing does. Who makes the rules? And what are the restrictions on making the rules? And I mentioned earlier something everybody knows. We don't have a written constitution, save in relation, perhaps, to the provisions of devolution, which are, of course, very important, but they don't affect these rights we're speaking of individual rights for individual people. And who makes the rules is therefore critically important because we don't have a backstop constitution, unlike the provisions, for example, of the EU Charter, saying that there must be protection in these areas. So, in theory, Parliament can enact and government can put forward, and with a majority in Parliament, if it has it, can enact proposals of any kind good, better than the EU law, or sadly worse. Deal or no deal, uh, Brexit is going to be a reality soon. Many experts believe that it could actually be a chance for the UK to develop better human rights. Do you believe this? Do you believe that it could actually be beneficial? Express the view you mentioned. It would be very interesting to know why they think that things could get better. Equally, it would be very Eeyore-like and glass half empty to say everything's bound to get worse. We still have some very important provisions which will continue to protect human rights and first amongst them is the fact that we are parties to the European Convention on Human Rights which is not part of EU law or rather it wasn't generated by EU law and we incorporated that into domestic law by the Human Rights Act back in 1998, which came into effect in 2000. So we've had nearly 20 years of that protection. A question, and I would put it to the experts who say it will all get better, it, and that is that the government on the whole, and I don't mean the present government, I mean governments, successive governments of the United Kingdom, have been very cautious about extending individual rights. So the government has been very cautious historically governments after government, not just the present government, but UK governments have been very cautious about accepting new rights for individuals. It took a very long time for the European Human Rights Convention to be incorporated into domestic law. For years, the governments, successive governments, said it wasn't necessary. When we first ratified the convention in 1953, the Parliament was told that, of course, these rights were already fully protected by English law. And it was only nearly 50 years later that the Convention was brought into effect. And similarly, as I mentioned in relation to the EU Charter, there was great reluctance to allow this new list of rights to become part of domestic law. Is it because governments are full of bad people? No, not at all. You have to remember how human rights operate. They operate as a restriction on the powers of government because they give ordinary people rights. So ordinary people can say to a government department or a local authority or any other public body, can you really do that? Are you lied to? That interferes with my rights. Please don't do that. And the governments have to respect that. Now, 
The experts you mention, who apparently believe that human rights protection will improve after Brexit, will have to first face the question, why are governments changing? Why is the United Kingdom's government's attitude likely to change in relation to fundamental rights protection because we leave the EU? And the second question is, by the way, if human rights protection is going to be better after Brexit, why does the government propose and the legislation which has been adopted implement the removal from English law of the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights? And thirdly, where is the inspiration for this further development and improvement of human rights protection to come from? Will we continue to protect all the rights which are protected in the European Union and which the European Union may develop in future? Well, I certainly hope that the answer to all those questions will be yes, and that the result will be a great improvement in human rights protection in this country regardless of whether it's due to Brexit or not. But I'm afraid I would keep my packet of salt very close. What are the proactive steps that every person should take to ensure our human rights after Brexit? Well, the first thing is, of course, in my personal view, and from the perspective of protecting fundamental rights, is to try, even now, to encourage people to think again. To think about the implications which are so much better understood about leaving the European Union and just to take the example of fundamental rights protection and after all it isn't just rights protection it's fundamental rights protection we're talking about and ask why was it necessary to dispose of the rights in the EU Charter are we not good enough for those rights is the government no longer capable of delivering those rights what is it that's changing in such a way that we need to jettison those fundamental rights. So that's, I'm afraid, my first rather politically negative approach. Don't do it. If we have to do it, we will have to be very vigilant in a way which, fortunately, the non-governmental organizations in this country in particular and many other individuals have been determined and active to do over many, many years. And again, if you take the example of equal pay, a provision which was introduced many years ago in legislation, but which was even now, 40, sorry, 50 years later, still not properly implemented as survey after survey reveals, technically, Equal pay for equal work has been a principle of English law since the 1960s. Vigilance, determination, and I'm sorry to say it, but as a lawyer I'm bound to, litigation, if necessary, will be more necessary than it ever was before. Piers Gardner, many thanks for joining us today and sharing with us your expertise on the human rights situation after March the 29th. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today to discuss this burning topic. Please join us again next time. Until then, goodbye.